Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, even though the equinox is still another three weeks away, we generally consider March 1st to be the beginning of spring here uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. And I wanted to take a look back at what winter gave us. We're going to start with the drop monitor. So what you've got here is the drop monitor released on October the 6th. I'm going to play for you through the month of October into November now, December, into January, and February. Now, as I play this again, I want you to be watching where drought improved and where drought has gotten worse. And as I look at this, I see that parts of the Pacific Northwest showed improvement. The Northeast showed improvement. East of the Mississippi River largely is drought-free. Let's watch it one more time. But the drought development over the Northern Plains, the establishment of drought over the Four Corners and over parts of California has been the mainstay of what we've seen in terms of dryness this winter. Now, thinking about this, an area that I expect to see quite a bit of improvement in next week's, or excuse me, later this week's drop monitor update will be into this area right in through here. Because as you look, this was early this morning, we were still watching a few lines of thunderstorms that were moving out of parts of Texas over into parts of the Tennessee Valley. And by the way, over the weekend, some strong storms in parts of Tennessee, uh, northern Mississippi, even back toward Arkansas and Texas, uh, where we saw some reports of wind and some reports of hail. Just to see the animation here from Sunday uh, into the uh, early morning hours on Monday, you can almost get a sense of where the stalled out boundary is currently located right into this area here. As you notice, the, the precipitation pattern is, is overrunning and it tends to be training over the same locations. Now, this is an area that got hit with major ice storms, also some snow with the big cold air outbreak we had back in mid, or early and mid-February. And so as we have the combined effect of this rain plus that, this is uh, an area that's experiencing quite a lot of flooding. At the end, you do see the next wave that is coming out in Texas, and I'll talk about that in just a few moments here. In fact, let's go take a look at it just to get an idea, because this little trough here still has to eject, and it will be moving over toward the Carolinas later this week, maybe even a little mixture of snow into parts of Arkansas. But there is another wave that is behind it here that will cut into Southern California and kind of follow the same track. And that track is dominated by this big subtropical ridge here and the fact that the flow is diving into the northeast. So everything is going to run in that direction until this pattern breaks, which I'll show you when it's going to do that here in just a few moments. But over the last 72 hours, uh, this is just three days worth of rainfall. And from parts of East Tennessee, excuse me, Eastern uh, uh, Texas through Tennessee, getting up into parts of, of Kentucky here, there's a broad swath of three to six plus inches of rainfall. And this is why we have flooding across this region, a lot of swollen rivers in here. The rain did make it pretty far to the north. Uh, and to be honest with you, the, the, the GFS V16 did capture this better, I think, than the uh, European did initially. They both kind of came into alignment late. But you do see some heavy rain uh, parts of Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. On the backside, a lot of this was snow here coming through parts of the Dakotas. And just taking a quick look at that, this is one thing that last week in my Thursday video, I, we picked up on the, the corridor, but the amounts were underdone. And some pockets in here from Rapid City all the way over to just north of the Twin Cities, easily picking up over six inches of snow from this past weekend. Now from there, let's go take a look at the Western United States. This is basin average snow water content. So what we want to be seeing now that we enter March is these numbers at 100% or greater. And for much of the Pacific Northwest, including, of course, Idaho uh, and Washington and Oregon, the numbers are quite high, well over 100%. But California, the Sierra Nevada is still sitting between about 65 and 75%. And a lot of the four corner states uh, down here with numbers below um, 100 as well. Now remember, March along the front range can be very, very snowy. We got to think a lot about that. And the pattern change that is coming is going to help these numbers in the Sierra Nevada. And we got to get to talking about that. First, a bit on temperatures. Over the last week, we've seen a major recovery from what we saw from the cold air that was here from February 4th through about the 19th or 20th. Here we are looking at the 21st to the 28th, and it's been quite warm. And therefore, I want to start showing you these maps. This is total accumulated growing degree day units beginning on the 15th of February through the 27th. So the data will always be a couple of days old here. I get it from PRISM. And what you can see is that along the, the Gulf Coast, we have a lot of regions in here in 60 to 70 GDUs getting down to southern Texas, where we did bring that freeze, which we know damaged a lot of crops here. But we have since accumulated about 100 to 120 GDUs. Where the cold never got into the southern tip of Florida, it's they've of course accumulated a lot. But I want you to see that through the Central Valley of California, just in the last you know 15 days or so, have picked up about 75 GDUs. 
Now we can compare this to normal. And if we look over that same time period, of course we have the deficit due to the cold snap that was in Texas and the colder air that's still in place there early this week. But it's interesting to see how the warm up that we got here over the last several days has now brought this area. I know we're not ready to start planting and get stuff going here, but we've, we've got positive uh, GDU accumulation uh, during this time period. So we'll keep you updated on these maps as we move forward and show you different spreads of dates as well. Now it's this pattern I want to spend some time talking about. You're looking down to the North Pole through this week, so this gets us all the way to Friday evening. The jet stream features a very powerful subtropical branch right here. It then features a polar branch that splits. See how it goes up into Canada? That's going to keep much of the, you know, this section here of the plains getting down here into the Midwest quite dry. But the activity will be south right here, cutting over toward the Carolinas. And you're going to notice that as we get out here, through this week and early next week, that the atmosphere kind of favors more troughing here along the East Coast. Hence the cooler bias you're going to see all the way out to about day 10. But this is what I wanted everyone to see. By the time we get out there to early next week on March the 8th, the pattern is adjusting off the West Coast where both the subtropical and polar jet streams are coming together here to target the Southwest. This will be the beginning of an active time period into next week. But before I get there, let's at least see what we're going to get through the next seven days. So as we stated, it was going to be the Red River Valley of the South through the Southeast that's going to see these next few systems. Total accumulated precipitation through next Sunday at 6 p.m. is what's shown to you on this map. Again, as advertised, this area was going to be on the drier side of things, but the pattern change is going to really increase precipitation amounts here, especially for parts of California and uh, the, the Southwest. So let's get there and take a look at this. But first, how about comparing what we're going to get over the next week to normal? You can pick out easily those regions that are going to be drier than average with these colors. And of course, the south and southeast are quite wet with this pattern setting up. But as I said, the change that's coming, look at what happens by day 10. Strong subtropical branch cutting through Southern California, heading over to the Ohio River Valley. And with the troughs on the northern branch of the jet stream coming in like this, this will not only improve precipitation chances in California, this will increase in the upper Midwest the chance of seeing storm systems, and it will increase the likelihood of severe weather to the south. Because going from day 10 out to day 15, which takes us to the middle of March, this is where the strongest winds are forecast to be. So again, my main point here, big time changes in California precipitation, a return of moisture to the upper Midwest Northern Plains Great Lake Basin, potential for severe weather from Texas all the way over to North Carolina. That's the setup we're going to be seeing through the middle part of March. Now the European Ensemble, taking you out to day 15, sees the wetter conditions here and here. But you notice it's drier from, for example, the parts of the high plains of Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, all the way over here toward the Carolinas and Mid-Atlantic. What I'm going to tell you is that as systems come through like this, they will bring fronts into this area. And as they do that, remember that the model is not designed to be able to forecast convection, especially when we're looking at an ensemble average. So we're going to have to pay attention to the pattern and what that means for the southern part of the United States and the potential for severe weather. And it's something I want you to all be on the lookout for if you're in that part of the country. Now here in the near term, we have a system exiting the northeast today. So a lot of this is wind issues and dense fog, but we have flood threat on the back side of this. As you can see, that's where that stalled out boundary is. Dense fog along the Gulf Coast. We have where the Elkhorn and Platte River are in this part of Nebraska. Ice jam problems here. And there's hard freeze warnings still out for parts of southern uh, Arizona here. Let's watch the high resolution NAM model pick up on the pattern here through the next 60 hours, which will take us out to early in the morning here on Wednesday. What you're going to see as we play it forward is the stalled out boundary in this area, bringing the precipitation to the east, and then the second system emerging and pushing over here toward the Carolinas. We'd like to show you a couple of the details. Through mid morning, what we're going to notice is here it is. This is now getting through early this morning and mid-morning. We could get a few of those lines breaking off of the main boundary where the thunderstorms were that kind of push some stronger, uh, some thunderstorms, but some heavier rains through locally through parts of Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. But you do notice that as the first low moves through the northeast and brings that rain to the coast, the second wave begins to emerge once we get out here into the overnight hours tonight and early tomorrow morning right here along the Red River Valley of the south over to parts of the lower Mississippi River Valley. Now, in parts of Arkansas, just pay attention to this. 
and could get a mix midday tomorrow right here in this part of Arkansas. And again, this is an area that has seen a tremendous amount of snow here in the month of February. And March might give you just a little bit more there. But this is going to spread more rain through Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and back into Tennessee where we just got pummeled. And we're going to see this rain spreading into the Carolinas by the time we get into early Wednesday morning. Now to take it from here, we got to switch over to the European model. So let's get that plan, all right? So going forward here, let's let it get all the way out to Wednesday morning. So there we go. And let's see that first low exit parts of the southeast. And by the time we get into Wednesday evening, it'll almost be off the coast. Now at this time, that little wave I mentioned to you is cutting into California, spread some snow in the mountains and some rain in the valleys here into Arizona and really into the four corner states by 6 a.m. Thursday. But high pressure is kind of in place in the midsection of the country, keeping things relatively dry. Could be a little bit of lake effect snow on the downwind side of the Great Lakes. But here we are into Thursday. This is now getting into early Friday morning. And we're going to watch for that low to kind of cut through parts of Colorado. Now remember, the, the front range of the Rockies here, This is March is a time where there is quite a bit of snowfall. We could see that getting into parts of the high plains by the time we get into Friday. So pretty wild ride on temperatures there in the high plains. We then go into Friday midday. This is now working our way through uh, the early part of the weekend. And as we talked about, the main track stays south until we get into next week. Now, at this point, we've just run out here to Saturday morning. We're going to watch a little system that could be clipping through parts of Wisconsin, Illinois, maybe spreading some light snow into parts of Indiana, northern Indiana, Ohio, and southern Michigan. But what I'd like to do to finish this is I just want to play the rest of the of the operational European model. Now, from this point forward, we can't take any of this for truth in the forecast, but we need to see the change up. Are you ready? So playing this forward, I want you to watch the West Coast. Do you start to see lows early next week dipping farther to the south? See that? They then pull through the mountains and emerge not in the southern plains, but in the central and northern plains. And this is going to be the setup for much of next week through about day 10 to 15. More systems pulling in this direction rather than diving to the south, splitting around this region. So that's the change I wanted you to see. Over the next week, total accumulated snowfall. Well, we just saw we could get some here over the weekend. This is the snow coming through. We just talked about in Arkansas and a little bit in the Appalachian Mountains. But we will see considerable changes here from the Sierra Nevada into the Great Basin and Intermountain West as we play forward here. And possibly more snow here for the Northern Plains, despite the warmer forecast you're going to see me give you in just a few moments. So we'll come back to this again. Wetter here wetter there as we look out exclusively into week two but with more systems tracking in this direction i just want to make it a point again we could see those fronts sliding through you know the southern plains lower mississippi river valley and increasing the threat for severe weather getting us out toward the middle of the month of march now the question is how long does it hang on this is now the third week of March, getting out to the 24th. And we see that during that time period, the European model favors the, you know, the Mid-South through the Tennessee Valley and the Ohio River Valley as the active storm track in through this area. Still keeping normal precip amounts across much of the West. But there's a lot that could potentially alter this pattern. I'm going to show you what I mean by that in just a few moments. First, let's talk temperatures. Here's Monday's high temperatures uh, and the departure from normal. So it was another cool day forecast in Texas, quite warm on the southern side of that boundary that's still stretched in this area. But watch this week in the northern plains. You ready? As we play this forward, let's go watch this again. Let's go from here into the day on Tuesday. Very warm here in the central and northern plains. Cooler air tries to exit east. By Wednesday, broad warmth across much of the country with only some cooler weather hanging on from the lower Mississippi River Valley over to the Carolinas. And as we go into the end of the week, this is Thursday, now getting into the day on Friday, you see the split flow taking shape here with the cooler weather than average stretching from Texas over toward the East Coast with the much above average temperatures here across the Northern Plains as the flow, remember, kind of splits and comes back together here over the East Coast. But taking you out through the weekend, this is how things shape up on Sunday. Now, remember, this is before the pattern changes for the northern plains of the United States. But let's take a look at what those temperatures are going to do here. Because even out day 5 through 10, we maintain the warmer bias here across the upper Midwest, across the central and northern plains, getting up in the Canadian prairie. It's in both models with the cooler weather along the east. And now to day 5 through 10, now this is what I'm talking about. Do you start to see the cooler pattern here? 
in both the models. That's the adjustment in the jet stream. Now, remember, it's coming in like this. There's the polar branch, there's the subtropical branch, and things go like that. So I know that when you look at this, we see here in the northern plains and upper Midwest a warmer bias, but I'm telling you, expect rapid fluctuations. It's not just going to stay warm the whole time. But this pattern, if it is going to stick around, like the models suggest, all the way out into the third week of March, we have to know at the end of my video today what could break this down and make the models wrong. Because you see here, all the way out to the third week of March, a lot of similarity here over the next 15 days. So stick around for the next couple of moments here as I explain to you what would have to be wrong. We're going to start in the tropics. The MJO pops out of phase six, cuts over into phase seven and eight. And during that time period, if the MJO continues throughout middle and end of March to wrap around through phase one at high amplitude over toward the Indian Ocean, which is phases two and three, that would be a signal that the end of the March pattern, which is still favoring warmth in the eastern half of North America, would be wrong, would be wrong. Now, thinking about that, over the next 15 days, a large area of subsidence is dominating the tropics here in the Pacific Ocean. And so to know if this is going to happen, if the MJO is going to help the models, or excuse me, help the jet stream pattern go cooler instead of what we saw in the warmer forecast, well, I'll tell you, the coolest marches for east of the uh, Rocky Mountains had a lot of rising motion here, not subsidence. So that doesn't seem to line up very well as we look out over the next 15 days, hence the warmer pattern east of the Rockies. What about getting up into the Arctic or over toward Greenland? Well, the Arctic Oscillation has got to go negative, and it's not negative. When it's negative, we have a big ridge that sits here, a high-pressure cell that just pushes all the cold air out of the Arctic. That could be helped around uh, along excuse me, if the North Atlantic Oscillation would also go negative, and that would feature a big diving trough here over the east, including a large ridge that builds up into Greenland. Neither of these things are currently in place. The Arctic Oscillation is going to go up to four standard deviations above average, and the NAO two standard deviations above average, which is why over the near term, neither of these two features is helping the cooler air arrive and stay in the eastern, you know, two-thirds of the United States and, and, and Canada. From there, you know, we have to look at Alaska and the West Coast. Now, the Pacific North American pattern, okay, it would have to go positive, meaning we need to build a big ridge here along the west to allow cold air to dive and stay in the central part of the United States. Well, what's the PNA doing? It's not going positive. It's forecast to stay negative for much of the front half of March here. And finally, Alaska is the other key. And the, the EPO, the East Pacific Oscillation, we need it to go negative so that we build a big ridge over Alaska, therefore causing the air once again to dive into the central part of the country, coming down the Canadian prairie and getting cold. What's the EPO doing? Well, it's not going negative. It's kind of bouncing around here, but largely staying positive. So what I'm trying to tell you is these are the things that we're going to watch to see if they change looking out there into week three, week four and into April. This is the, the meteorological events that would need to constructively come together to change the pattern moving forward. And I'll watch it and keep you informed. Appreciate your attention this week. Hope you all have a great week and we'll talk to you again very soon. Thanks.